morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, good. If you would just stand with us this morning, we're going to get started. It's so good to see everyone here in the house this morning. We just welcome you this morning. We welcome everybody you watching online. We're so happy to be here this morning. So excited to see each one of you here. If you would, let's just lift our hands this morning.
do that, you can just go back to your seat. Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line. Will all the other not quite? Will all the never get it right? But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time. Cause I'm just a nobody We're trying to tell. you lord thank you lord boy what a message that's what it's all about folks amen people seeing christ in us that is what it's all about praise the lord man i'm just gonna go ahead and tell you i i'm just on the edge of being fired up And uh, I thank God for it. And uh, I'm going to tell you, God is moving. He is moving. 
and I believe that he's going to continue to move. You know, Elijah got down and prayed, and we talked about this the other night. And he sent his servant to look. He was praying that it would rain. And his servant kept coming back time and time again. Uh, and he's like, uh, still not doing anything out here. But finally, he came, came back and he said, I'm seeing a cloud just about the size of a man's hand. And I believe I'm seeing the cloud. Amen. I believe I'm seeing the cloud. And when you see the cloud, you're going to have to start running. I'm sorry. You're going to have to start moving. You're going to have to start moving. God's doing something. God's doing something. And I want to be a part of it. And I want you to be a part of it. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm telling you, if you will let him, and those, <laughs> those of you that know me, you know I don't just throw words out there. If you'll let him, God's about to radically do something in your life. Glory to God, I'm telling you. He is. I'm talking about he's about to do something radical in you. God's going to do something in you. But we've got to let him. And we've got to desire it. And... Uh, Man, I could, I could stand up here and just go on and on, but I just want to quickly tell you that for a good long while now, I've known that there was something that was missing, and I've had, I've had a desire. I've even seen uh, in the spirit, I've seen preaching... Uh, uh, what is it I'm trying to say? Uh, crusades. And I've seen that for a good long while, just in, in my spirit. And uh, I don't know, I, you know, I may have been, I may have been like Jonah and just, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get real with y'all. Some people may not like it. Somebody, some people, I'm just, I'm just telling you, some people might be like, mm, that's a little too real for me. But that's just the way it's going to have to be. I may have been like Jonah. I may have been running from it. But then, you know, <clears throat> look, it's not about whether I get asked to preach somewhere or not. But then... My niece, Julie, she felt led to put on a thing over at the Coliseum uh, called Unhindered. And then she called me and said, asked me if the Lord had spoke to me about anything. Now, I mean, who does that? And I just said, well, as a matter of fact, and I shared with her what I'd had in my heart about the about the crusade thing and then anyway she they asked me to come and speak there Casey Casey and I went and spoke there and and but my point is this there's something that's in my heart and I believe it's a stirring by the Holy Spirit and I'm going to try to be led by God's word and by God's Holy Spirit and I've and I've told us I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be going back to what I'm calling the old wells of revival, and just allowing God to lead me what I believe is the proper foundational steps that will lead us 
if you will, into the Holy of Holies. And, there, and there's got to be some work done. Uh, uh, the prophet said to break up the fallow ground. What does that mean? Well, uh, when ground gets hard, a farmer has to break up the ground because the ground's too hard to receive the seed. And spiritually speaking, God's people over time, not meaning to, but our hearts can become hardened. And God has to set down his turning plow and to break that ground up in our hearts so that we can even receive from the Lord. And for us to be able to have the kind of faith that I believe that, that God is desiring for us to walk in, a spirit of faith. And we're going to touch on that, but not now. And then for us to have the kind of prayer that I believe God is desiring for us to pray, a spirit of prayer, an effectual prayer. But we're going we're gonna to get on that, but not, but not now. Before that, we've got to have, we've got to have a spirit of repentance. And I know when you say that word, you know, hey, when you say that word, I guess automatically in the natural, it's kind of like, you know, you want to just say, well, you know, that's going to put a dampener on everything. No, it's not. It's going to bring a tremendous blessing. Tremendous blessing to, to our lives and to your lives. And that's what God desires for us. And there's times that we have to do this. So God is, is moving. Uh, I'm observing. I'm looking. We've been up to tent revival up to Sylvania. And I, I've loved it. And uh, for those of you that are watching, um, I know you're hearing what I'm saying. If you're watching this, you know, people scared of tent revivals. Just to tell you the truth, people are scared of the Holy Spirit, and especially when you say Holy Ghost. But I sat down there and I'm thinking, I mean, the first two nights, it drained me emotionally. I had a crap family there. My goodness. I'm telling you, it was like heaven came down and glory filled my soul. It was good. It was good, and uh, had some really, really good preaching. Great. Everybody did so great. Um, I just enjoyed it. So, you know, I think that that's part of what God is doing. You know, somebody, uh, God has touched somebody's heart to do something. Brothers and sisters, we got to start doing something. And, and... I think it's it's starting with me, so I've got to I've got to get myself into the right frame of mind and, and attitude of spirit and surrender unto the Lord, um, <clears throat> so that you know God can work through me and God can work through us, and so. <clears throat> I've already shared with you. I'm going to tell you again. I got down and got very, very humble with God. And I confessed anything that I can think of. And I may have even confessed things that I had already confessed. But I want to tell you something. When you, when you allow yourself to be broken before the Lord, you'll do that. You will do that. And I'm here to tell you today that I got a healing. I got a healing in my body. Uh, that would be called a sign and wonder. In case you don't know. A sign and wonder. God did that. 
Is there anything too hard for God? Nothing too hard for him. I've never been a sign seeker. I've never been a miracle chaser. That's not a pat on my back. I'm just making a statement. I've never been one that seek after that stuff. But uh, I have read in the Bible where it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. <laughs> hey, glory to God. Did it not say that? It says that. I'm excited. I got the joy of the Lord. So, so well, you, you bragging. I'm just stating the facts. God's not a respecter of persons. Hallelujah. I believe that if we're willing, we're going to see great and mighty things. Are you in Nehemiah with me today? Stand up with me, please. Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to reverence the Word of God. We've got to get back. If you're not a lover of God's Word, you need to change your mind today and become one. Because as you love God's Word, you love Him. Because His Word is alive. He is alive. His word is alive. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Susan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity here in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's stop right there. Stop with me right there and let's pray. Lord, as we come before you today, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we want to thank you for your word that is truth. And Lord, I want to thank you for every person that's here, every family that's represented. God, I thank you for them. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in our hearts. And God, I give you the praise for it right now. Lord, may our hearts right now be good ground to receive this word and to see. And let, Lord, just let us be honest with ourselves and, and let us be able to apply it to our own lives. And Lord, just have your way. Do what you desire to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name, And everybody said amen. Amen. So you may be seated. So word came to Nehemiah about God's people, about the affliction that they were in, about the, um, the, uh, the wall in Jerusalem had been broken down, the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And, and, and look, he said, and when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now listen, think with me. What kind of shape is our world in today? Our world. What kind of shape? There's so many people that are hurting. There's so many things, if you will, that have been broken down. God, they took so many things away in society. You know, the list is just on and on. We could just think of so many Things. I mean, uh, can I just be honest with you today? And I, I never would have thought that I would have ever even had this kind of a thought. But just to, to look, it's all—it's almost like that things have become so wicked it nearly make the devil blush. That's crazy. That's crazy. We need to be moved. We need to be moved. We 
need to be touched by what we're seeing and what we're hearing and what's going on today. And he prayed to the Lord in verse 5. And verse 6, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou may, mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night. Day and night. It got down in his soul, brothers and sisters. I, I, very few times in my life have I ever had anything to just get down in me like that. And, and of course, we know, you know, kind of what that was at a time in our life. And, and, uh, and it will. It'll get down in you. And uh, I, I can see the Lord raising up uh, people that will allow things to get down in us and to move us um, to move us into prayer and to move us into uh, an attitude of repentance ourselves and and so he goes on and he says uh, for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sin now notice what he says here and confess the sins of the children of Israel now here he's talking about the children of Israel's sins but he says, which we have sinned, both I and my father's house have sinned. That's, that's what Nehemiah said. Uh, when you look through and you see most of the leaders uh, that, that's mentioned in scripture, they, they, they owned their sin. Uh, you know, not trying to cover it up. I know David was kind of slow to come around, but the Bible said he had a heart for God, and God had to deal with him in a little different way, and he sent the prophet Nathan to him, but he repented. He didn't say, no, you, you got the wrong man. That, that wasn't me. No, he owned his sin, and and he repented of that sin. And to repent means to change your mind and to turn. He says, so he says, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou commanded thy servant Moses. Well, how would this affect us today? I, somebody may say, well, brother, you, you've said we're not we're not under the law. We're, we're not under the law to try to earn salvation. No, we're not under the law in that we're trying to keep the law so that God will see how good we can keep the law and him save us. We're not under the law in that sense. But Jesus said, think not that I came to destroy the law but to fulfill the law. And Jesus came and his death fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law and then when he imputed his righteousness into us as born again believers and gave us his Holy Spirit he enabled us to be able to keep his word so he fulfilled the law in that he wrote it on our hearts now, I want to tell you, if you're a born-again child of God, you've had God's law written in your heart. And, and that's a wonderful thing to have that. And so, and so he confessed sin, and he went on, and he said, uh, he goes on, and I'm going to move on here and... Uh, and so, uh, and, and as a result of, of him confessing sin, as a result of that, he moves on here and uh, he goes to the king. Verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's. Cup bearer. Now, basically, here's what you're going to see happen right here. 
as a result of Nehemiah confessing the sin of the people and confessing his own sin. As a result of this, God showed him favor. God begins to show him great favor. In chapter 2, God grants him favor with the king, and he asks the king if he can have a leave, if he can go, uh, because he wants to rebuild what's been broken and tore down. He even asked the king if he would be so kind would would you allow your your supervisor that's over the timbers in the forest to take down some of the good ones for me? And God did that for him. And it says here in verse 4 of chapter 2, Then the king said unto me, For what doest thou make request? And he said, So I prayed to the God of heaven. Hallelujah. He prayed to the God of heaven. And then I want you to see, I, I, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the journey of this man's faith right here because as, okay, he, 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 they saw and they heard what was going on among God's people. Okay, they were moved to, to repent before God, to be honest, before God. They were moved to do that. And then uh, God showed them favor. But now there was a confidence. There was a confidence level or a faith level that began to increase in his life. And so he, this is what he says. He said in verse 18 of chapter 2, Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Did you see that? And see, that's what, ha that's what happens. God's, God's presence will become more real to us. And you'll know, you'll know like, man, I'm walking with God. I have him with me. Nehemiah, Nehemiah said, the hand of my God was good upon me, uh, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me, and they said, let us arise and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And, of course, there was opposition. There was opposition. But the opposition didn't stop the move of God. Uh, I think I've read somewhere where he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Amen. And greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Verse 20, and then we're going to move on from this. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Man, he had faith. He, his faith was growing. His faith had been energized to say this is what God is going to do. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build but then he said, you have no portion to write in a memorial in Jerusalem. But he had great faith in what God was doing there. God used this man in a, in a great way. And I can see revival working very similar to this. Because before we can get to the kind of prayers that we need to pray and the kind of faith that we need to have, we've got to have this willingness for God to do this work within us. Uh, I, want, I want you to turn, I want you to turn now, if you can, to 2 Corinthians 13.5, 13, and I want you to see this. Um, in 2 Corinthians 13.5, the Bible says, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. Now let me read this in the Amplified Version. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. In other words, don't test the Lord. Test yourself. D 
do, do, do you not yourselves realize and know thoroughly by an ever-increasing experience that Christ, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved, on trial, and re rejected? Now, what's, that, what's he talking about there? Well, first of all, he's saying that people in churches should first examine themselves and make sure that they're saved. Make sure that they have had a born-again experience. And I just want to remind us, brothers and sisters and moms and dads and grandparents, our children must be born again. They, they must be born again. And you're training them up in the way that they should go. Amen. But just remember, they at that time, when that, whenever that age of accountability is, and the Bible doesn't tell us a certain age, but there will be a time that they're just going to know that something's uneasy and something's not right and that they must be born again. And that's where I want you to be prepared to lead them. Be prepared to lead them the right way. Now, people in church, there's people in church that aren't saved. Are you saying, am I saying absolutely for 100% fact that there's people in this church that's not saved? No, I'm not saying that. I, I don't know that. But there's people in church that's not saved. There's what's called tares that's been planted among the wheat. Jesus talks about that in the Gospels. And Jesus gave instructions. Actually, he gave an indication that you might know some tares. But he said they look very close to a tare. I mean, to a wheat. They grow up this, and look very similar. But they've been planted there by an enemy. That's what that parable teaches. So there's people in church that are not saved and uh, it goes on it says what's going to happen with these tares is that when the Lord comes back angels are going to gather these tares and these tares are going to be put into bundles and they're going to be burned somebody may say well that's, that's awful straightforward preacher well, I'm just telling you what the word teaches that's the, the word teaches that tares are going to be burned. Uh, the word teaches that unbelievers that are truly unbelievers, um, they're not going to go to heaven uh, if they're if they're unbelievers. Only believers, only true, repentant, repented in the heart believers are going to go to heaven. Now, so he's. It's good for us to examine ourselves because people, people have had so many experiences. But I've seen, and you have seen too, cases where people grew up and they come to find out and to believe that they really wasn't truly converted. And I will tell you this before we move on. I want you to be honest with yourself and allow God to search your heart. If there's never been a time that you've repented of your sin, if there's never been a time that you've turned away from sin and confessed to God your sin and became a new creation, then you're still lost in your sins. You're still lost in your sins. Before you can experience revival, you need to be revived. You need to pass from death to life, and you need to be saved and born again. And so this will be part of the things that God is going to do because as we become obedient to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is going to reach down into some deep areas where people are hiding. I just want you to know that there's people that's hiding. 
there's people that have really, truly not never opened up their heart to God. And there is a self-deception. James says, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Some people are deceived into feeling like that they're okay. Now, on the other hand, there's some people that are saved, that are truly saved, and still experience condemnation, and they need assurance. And amen, and God's going to do that too. But it's a scary thing, the Bible says, to fall into the hands of the living God. It should be a fearful thing for us. So we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we're saved. And then secondly, make sure that we're living in faith and ex exercising our faith as we need to be properly doing. So uh, that being said, uh, turn with me to Revelations. Uh, Revelations <clears throat> talks about the seven churches and in these seven churches, these letters to the seven churches, these were seven real churches of that day and they represent seven types of churches today. Why are you taking me there? Because I want to tell you that in most of these situations, with the exception of a couple, they were told to repent. These churches were told to repent. Now, you know, we're not going to, I don't want to put you to sleep. You go back and, and you read this and read about these seven churches and you'll see that God commends some of them. Uh, but really, the church at Philadelphia was the one that was in the best shape with the Lord. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that that church was a church that exhibited brotherly love? They were strong in love. I want to tell you, God wants a church with a deep love. God wants a church with a, God wants a Christian with a deep love for other, for other Christians. Amen. Uh, that's, that's what he desires. But he says time after time again, he points out things to these churches, the things that he has against them, and he tells them to repent. He gives them <clears throat> an opportunity for them to repent. So this, this, this falls in line with what we're doing. Uh, I'm repenting. I'm going to be repenting not only in me, but I'm going to be repenting for things uh, in this church, uh, things that maybe have gone wrong, maybe things that were not done right. Um, I'm going to be repenting of that. We as a church, are, I'm going to get you to come into agreement together with me concerning these things so that we can repent of these things so that we can be in the right position for God to move and to use us because this is how serious I am about this. Uh, I'm not going to think for one minute that this church doesn't need to repent and I don't want you to think that. Don't think that for one minute. And I will, I will tell you, that in one instance, I'm not, I'm not going to go over there because I'm going to take too much time with this and everybody's going to fall out of their chairs for the wrong reason. And I don't want you to fall backwards unless God's in it. And, but he said some of you, one of them had the reputation that they were alive, but he said you're actually dead. That's what he said about the church. He said, in some of these churches, he said, he said, I know you're in Pergamos in, in Revelation 2, 13. He said, I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. You see that? Now, are we so high tech and sophisticated today that Satan don't have a seat in our churches somewhere? 
Absolutely not. If Satan had a seat in churches during that era, he has a seat in churches today. So, <clears throat> we need not think. Now, when I say everybody needs to repent, do I, am I saying that everybody's guilty of the same thing? No, absolutely not. Am I saying that everybody's sinning on the same level or what? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But... I'm saying <clears throat> I'm saying that we need all of us to examine ourselves and just be willing to let the word and the holy spirit shine the light in the dark places. And if there's anything there, let's confess it and repent of it and turn away from it and let God heal us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You mean God's people's got wicked ways? He said we did. Yeah. If my people who are called by my name, are you called by his name? Yeah. Will humble themselves. Are we willing to humble ourselves? I am. I'm humbling myself. We'll humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And I've already got a healing yeah. in me from confessing sin before God. Now, 1 John 1.10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar or we call God a liar and his word is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, it's the same thing of uh, saying, uh, God, you're a liar. Yeah. Okay, uh, in John, 1 John 2, 4, he that <clears throat> saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, um, he says, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In other words, if you don't do God's word, and you don't have his commandments written in your heart, but you say that you know him, the Bible says you're a liar. In another place, he says, let God be true and every man a liar. See, God knows what condition that we're in. In another place, he says in 1 John 4, 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. God said, he says, if we say that we love God but we hate a brother, he says we're liars. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Amen. That's strong words, but I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a healing message. It is, absolutely. It's a healing message if we allow it to be. And some, of, some people, some of you in here are going to have to make some things right with a brother or a sister or someone in order for you to have revival. See, we can go to churches and blend in that have a name that they're alive but are actually dead. And we can pretend everything's right because, you know, we're, we do this, we participate in this, you know, and we can have the showing. Matter of fact, in another place over there in Revelations, he said there are those that call themselves Jews that are not. Well, he can say that because God knows our heart. And there's people that call themselves Christians that are not. And there's people that are harboring all kinds of things in their heart that are not saved. They're unwilling to allow God to turn up the fallow ground of their heart. So I encourage you, hey... <clears throat> If the shoe fits, let's just put it on and wear it. I want to be right with God. I want to be right with God, and I want to lead us the right way. If God's doing a fresh work in me, I want him to do a fresh work in you so that God can use us. And then he says, 1 John 5, 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. Okay? He that believeth upon the Son of God hath this witness within himself. Do you have the witness within you? 
is the Holy Spirit witnessing within you that you're his child. Uh, Romans 8 and 9 says, He that hath not the Spirit is none of his. Uh, 1 John 5 teaches us that, uh, that if we're saved, that, that, we, that we, we can know. These things have I written unto you that believe in the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. Amen. If you have eternal life, oh, I, I, I feel James coming. But I speak the truth in love. If you, if you have eternal life, if you claim to have eternal life, if you claim to be a Christian and you live like the devil, you ain't no more saved than a rock. You ain't no more saved than a rock. It, 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 it don't matter. Words are so easy to come by. Words are so easy to speak. And how you treat people and the fruit you bear, make no mistake about it. These people done read your fruit. And they know. And God knows. And I recommend that you repent. That you repent of your sin before God. And then he goes on, he says in Revelation 21, 8, he says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. You know, it's interesting that he, he, he listed these categories, but when he got to liars, he said all liars. <laughs> all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself because God knows if you're not right with God, let's get it fixed today. Let's get it fixed right now. Let's not put it off and let's not wait if you're not right with him. Now, I need to close. It's going to take me just a few, a few minutes. Romans 12. Romans 12, I want you to see this because it says in verse 9 and 10, let love be without dissimulation, or let it be real. Let our love be real. Abhor that which is evil. Flee from that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love and in honor preferring one another. Why are you saying that? Well, you know, Jesus spoke of John the Baptist and he told how great he was. He said of, of, of all men that's been, that's been born, he said there was none greater than John the Baptist. But he said, but the very least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. Think about that. The very least. And this, this day and time we, that we live in, don't get me wrong, some of you are gifted tremendously, but you're not the only one. And God's looking for a church that people will demonstrate humility and prefer the other even over ourselves. We've got to come together in one mind and one accord. And set our sights on him. Glory to God. I nearly turned backwards. And set our sight on him. And be of the mindset, God, I don't care. You don't have to use me. If you do, that's fine. But use somebody else. And then if God's using somebody else, rejoice that God's using somebody else. Rejoice that God's using somebody else. And be happy that somebody else can sing. Be happy that somebody else can play. Be happy that somebody else can do a drama. Be happy for all the others that are doing things behind the scene. We, we, we put, we, we, that's just human nature. We just put people up there and... 
you know, the flesh just gets all over that. The flesh can get all over that. B, and brothers and sisters, as, as we do this, I've got to get this out because here, here's what I'm tempted to do. I'm tempted to take so many things and make a message and it's going to take me eight weeks. Brothers and sisters, guard yourself against jealousy. Guard yourselves against envy. Just want, <clears throat> just want what God is doing and what he's going to do and for his glory to come down and fall. And, and then here's another thing. And I, 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 this has turned into a shotgun message now. But Matthew 25 in 24 and 25, it talks about it talks about talents that the Lord gave out, and people buried their talents. But I, and I want I want you just I want you to 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 bring this up for the concept, for the model. You know, uh, a talent is money. That's what it represents. And, and God wants us to invest into his kingdom so that it might make increase. Amen. He says, lay not up treasures on earth where moth and rust is able to come in and destroy, but lay up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. He wants us to invest into his kingdom. And he wants us to give him what we have so that he can take it and multiply it. Think about Jesus performing the miracle over feeding the 5,000 with women and children, 15 to 25,000. And all he had to work with, all he had to work with is how many fish? Two and five loaves of bread. But you add the two together, two's the number of witness, five's the number of grace, seven is the number of perfection and completion. And little is much when God is in it. When we take and give what we have, what is it that God has blessed you with that you can do? Romans 12 verse 6 Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on our teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. What am I saying? I take the model from Matthew 25. Some of us have buried our gifts. Some of us have buried our gifts. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you, I don't uh, I don't claim to be a, a great with anything, okay? But you know, God has given me some songs and I've buried them. And I'm here to tell you to tell you that I'm about to resurrect them. And I'm, and I'm getting it out of the ground. Why are you going to do that? Just to put in the hands of God and let him use it and let him do whatever he wants to with it. Just let him, just let God have it. I'm asking you, God's given many of you gifts and abilities. He's giving He's given you talents. Actually, if you read this in Amplified, these gifts that he's given here in verse 6, having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace. See, they're grace gifts. God's, for some of you, God has gifted you. You came into this world with the ability to play a guitar and sing and play instruments like Drew. 
and there and there's others to sing like Drew, like Tricia, like everybody in here that can sing. Whatever it is that you can do, not everybody can do that, but everybody's got gifts. Man, everybody has got gifts. That's the way God put this thing together. What are you saying, Brother Mark? I'm saying dig them things out of the ground and give glory to God, to, to the one in whom it's due, and recognize, man, I can do this because God gave this to me. He expects me to use this. Then use it for His honor and glory. And I'm telling you, we're going to see God move when we realize that, man, I can help, I can do this, I can do a part. I'm gifted in this area and everybody's gifted in some area. I'm going to do it. I'm going to use it for His glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you stand up with me? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I need to ask someone, what day is Father's Day on? That's on the 20th. <laughs> thank you, brother. I needed that. I think, I think we needed that. I'm excited about what God's going to do. I, I hope that you don't let this repentance message put a dampener in your life, but I hope that you'll allow it to lift your spirits with the, the, the first of all, you know that it's the right thing to do, and secondly, what God is going to do when we get ourselves properly aligned with him. Amen. And... And I, I'm just, I'm excited about it. I, I am excited about being right with God and getting this church right with God. And uh, so if you'd bow your heads just for just a moment, you know, we don't have any music playing, but we don't even have to have any music playing. If you feel in your heart that God has spoken to you about salvation and you want to come and make sure you get it right this morning, I'm going to ask you to step out and come to the altar and I'm going to get down and pray with you. And we're going to get that took care of today. So if there's anybody in here that... You, you just know I'm just not I'm not where I need to be uh, it's just it's not here you may even think you know man I've been faking it uh, you may think I thought I was but I don't think that I am uh, I've shared this with you guys before my mother got married she was a young lady she was going to revival with her and dad mother told me, she said, I've always prayed from a child. She said, ever since I was a child, I've prayed. But the Lord got to dealing with her in that revival meeting. And she went down to the altar and she prayed this prayer. She said, God, if I'm not saved, I'm not saved. But if I am saved, I'm not God gave her confirmation. Yeah, I'm not telling you this to tell you that, that this happens to everybody, but she I came up from the altar shouting. And, and they lived a half mile away from the church. She shouted I all the way. God gave her confirmation. Because she nothing can right. hold me back. It's a no so salvation. That's what he'll do for us. He will let you go. Amen. You.
Some people may say, no, nah, you know, I can't do that. Well, if, if you can't, that's fine. Those of us that will are, we're going to confess our sins and write them out on a piece of paper. And then we're going to take it outside and burn it. And all I can tell you is that God knows my heart. See, we've gotten away from this thing about thinking about our sin. And there is a sense that we don't need to let guilt pull us down. And I get that, absolutely. But that's what I feel led to do, so that's what we're going to do next Sunday. And so... I just ask you to be in prayer. I believe God's going to take this, and I believe he's going to use it. That's certainly what I want him to do with it. And in doing this, I'm not trying to point any fingers at everybody or anybody because I'm going to be writing down things myself, and I'm going to be writing down things about this church where I feel like that we have failed and that I have failed as a pastor. And if we're willing, we're going to get right with God. And then we're going to put that in his hands. And then we'll continue on and we'll move on from this and we'll continue on to the next phase. I hope you're excited about that. If you're not, I pray that you will be. Amen. Because I believe this is the right, the right way to approach it. So many times revivals and things that are called revivals, so many times it's built up off it's built upon high emotion and excitement. And I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you that is coming. High levels of emotion and excitement are coming. But there is no higher level or emotion than when people are getting right with God. And then we're seeing God move in people's lives. Is that what we want to see? That's what we want God. Well, that's what we want to see. So you just better, as T D Jake, Jake says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because God is going to move. Amen. He's going to move. And with that being said, let's just pray a prayer together. So if you feel comfortable with this, would you just open your hands to the Lord? Father, as we come before you right now, Lord, we thank you for your word and what your word says. And what your word says, it will produce. Now, Father, I ask to be led of your Holy Spirit and of your word. And, Lord, I pray that we all will become of one mind and of one accord because when we read in the book of Acts what took place when people were in one mind and one accord, God, you performed miracles. You did salvation, which is the greatest miracle of all. You did great and mighty things things and mighty wonders and Lord it's so dark in this world Lord it's time for the church to wake up and to arise 
and to shine and be the people of God that you've called us to be and do the works that you've called us to do. Father, we thank you for it today. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And we give you the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give him praise today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you. And don't forget that meeting that Brother Steve talked about. how people in the church may not be saved, right? And so I just want to kind of share for just a moment my early story. And I, I promise I won't be forever long with this, but as a young man, probably 11 years old, I got invited to the church. And I wasn't raised in church, but some friends of mine that lived down the road said, hey, come to church with me. And I did. They're like, man, you got to be saved. you got to be saved. you got to be saved. And so I sit back in the pew, and, you know, they, they made an altar call, and I'm like, man, I'm supposed to be saved. And so I go down to the altar, and I ask God to forgive me and all that kind of stuff. But when I got up from the altar, there wasn't anything any different, right? Nothing changed in my life. Nothing changed anywhere else. And as a teenager, they started this Christians in Action, you know, CIA in school. And it's not like the government kind of stuff. It was Christians in Action. And I'm sitting there, and my friends are going, hey, man, you ever been saved? And I'm like, yeah, man, I've been saved. And they're like, man, you got to be saved. You got to be saved. You got to be saved. And they made an altar call, and I went down again. But nothing changed. Guys, nothing changed. And then I got married out of high school, and when I was 19, I went to a church. And at 19, now, I'd already repented twice according to what everybody had told me I had to do, right? But I knew nothing was different. But at 19, God was dealing with my heart. I mean, it was a different feeling, Right? And I'm going to tell you, they made an altar call. And the way that the guy presented it, he said, I want everybody to pray. He preached on Acts and the church praying until something happened. He called the church down to pray, but I knew I was lost as anything. And I stayed back in the altar. I never moved. But there was a man that, that knew God well enough and wanted to make him known to me. He looked up, and he seen me sitting back there, and I was just crying. And he came back, and he said, son, do you know God? I said, no, but I need to. And I knew at that moment I was saved. And, and why am I telling you this? If we're going to get to the point where our pastor wants us to be, guys, we can't have this, this attitude of salvation because we repeated a prayer after somebody years ago. We've got to know that it's a relationship with God. The Bible says that no man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. If God was not dealing with you, and I, all I'm asking you to do is think back on your day of salvation. Was God dealing with you, or were you just repeating what you knew to do? I'm going to challenge you to say, if God wasn't dealing with you, pray that he does. That's what makes the difference, is the Spirit drawing you. That's what's going to change your life. That's what changes how we act. That's what changes how we talk. That changes what we do. And just consider your day of salvation. And if it doesn't start with the drawing of the Spirit... Pray that it that God deals with you. Amen. Amen. Yes. Maybe after all that goes, but um, I feel like there's so many things that I want to do and I should have been doing, and there's so many things I should have been doing. But I'm beginning to think that I never should have been doing it. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I'd just like for y'all to stretch your hands out and pray with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you have heard Pam's heart. And God, you know, Lord, the words that she has written in this letter. Now, Father, we just, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would just saturate this letter and that when this letter is received, God, that the Holy Spirit is able through the words of Pam, 
Lord, to minister unto who this letter is given to. And Father, we thank you for it right now. Lord, this is an act of faith. Lord, this is not some kind of a hocus pocus thing. It's just simply an act of faith, Lord, just like a, a napkin was anointed, Father God, in the book of Acts. So, Lord, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to do the work that no man can do because, God, he is the spirit of truth. And you said when he comes that he would convict the world concerning sin and judgment and righteousness. And, Lord, I pray that through this letter, if that need on the end is sin and judgment and righteousness, God, that it will be ministered unto the one that it comes to. Now, Father, we thank you for this. We praise you. Now, Lord, we receive a good report by faith. And we thank you, God, that you're going to do a great thing through this. In Jesus' name, we'll give you praise. Amen and amen. Come on, give God praise this morning. Amen. Amen. We, we, are, we are going to do that. I'm getting to that. Uh, I didn't mention that today, but we are going to do that. But just to be quite honest with you, I believe the Lord spoke to my heart and said, we've got to do what I told you we're going to do next Sunday. We've got to do this first. So we're going to do it again. Pam, I want you to write another letter. We're going to write, <laughs> we're going to write some more letters, but that's fine. That's fine. Amen. So um, in case some of you weren't here, we're going to write some letters to people that God's laid on our hearts and share with them a testimony and then share with them uh, how, how, you, how you love them and how you care for them. And, 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 and so God's going to take that and he's going to use that. He's going to use it. We've got to have faith, brothers and sisters. Jesus said have faith in God. We've got to have faith. So, and we're getting to that. I think this is the right way to go about it. So, God bless you. I appreciate you so much. I want you to know I love you from the bottom of my heart. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Amen. So, we're going to turn you loose and let you go and let y'all have your meeting. Can I say something real quick? Okay. <laughs>